Hello and welcome to City Simply. These videos are really intended to be used with the free ebook on the website, which together provide the public with a free, easy access guide to changing the cities, to explain the characteristics that lead to not very nice places or lead to great places, and provide a toolkit to engage with good things and oppose bad things, and really provide knowledge and power because people live in cities and need that power to engage with, with change. So, where do we start? I've brought you here to the Blackwall Tunnel, care of Dot Brown's time machine in the mid-1930s, which I struggled to get to 88 miles an hour in East London. And what I want you to look at there is that building, that arch-type building from the turn of the 19th century. It's quite attractive, you know, I can wander around on foot, I could jump on that tram. You know, it's quite a nice environment here. And buildings like that are often looked at as a mark of a great city. You know, people focus on buildings and think great cities have lots of great buildings and that's not necessarily the case. And to explain that, we're going to go to 2020 where we can see the same building is there. And frankly, it's not very nice, is it? We're now in the middle of an urban expressway. We've got six lanes of traffic trying to mow me down in street furniture. And what has changed is the way that that building relates to all the space around it. And the space around it is wholly different to what it was when you could wander around on foot and it was quite nice. And it's that relationship between the building and the space and the place which has changed and made it to be really a rather unpleasant environment. And to explain that a bit further, well, we're going to take a cue from a cooking show. So back to the studio. Welcome to the studio. Now I'm going to try and explain how cities work, care of making pancakes. So I made two pancakes. The first, I've got all the ingredients. I've been put together exactly in the right order perfectly measured and we've made what looked like quite nice pancakes. They're the other ones I'm eating. And then in the second attempt, I have put all the same ingredients together, just not necessarily in the right order. And one extra ingredient, which is mainly to drink while we are waiting for them to cook. So we've, we've got through most of that now. And the second pancake, well, putting the ingredients together not necessarily right, the right order has made the pancake, which, well, I'm not going to eat. Dan, you're having that one later. And we here have two different scenarios with exactly the same ingredients. We can have this in a city where we can have all of the different ingredients add up to something which is more than the sum of its parts, or is less than the sum of its parts, or the sum of its parts. And both have got eggs in. Eggs are beautiful pieces of engineering care of nature. And the city we can have exactly the same. We can have a great building, which is a great piece of design or a great piece of engineering, but it may fit in the city like that, whereas actually we want it to fit in the city like that. And I'm now going to make myself really, really unpopular with the architecture world by taking it to one of those. This is the Lloyds Building in the City of London. It is an egg. It's a great piece of engineering, but it fits in the city more like this. Now, when we look at the Lloyds Building, in pictures, we see it from a distance, but actually we experience it on the street. So if we look at the camera now on the bike, we see we're approaching it. And as we approach it, all of the historic buildings facing the street, front onto the street, the main entrance faces the street, but we get to the Lloyds building and all we see is a tangled mass of forms. We see this tree sort of hidden, looking rather awkward there. We see a fire escape facing the main entrance. Well, let's carry on to the facing the main street around the main entrance. There is no main entrance there. There should be a main entrance there. Well, let's carry on around to the side street. Well, here we do see a entrance. It's steps. We've got to cross a parking area to get to it. It's not great. And in fact, there's a little sign saying it's not the main entrance. The main reception is further along. Well, let's carry on to it. So we pass a bike area a bit further down the street, further away from the main street. And we get a sign, look, Reception, great, but we've got to go down some steps to get to it, turn right back on ourselves, we can't even see it. Well, if we have to sign where main reception is or main entrance to a building is, we've probably got something wrong because that should be obvious. It should be on the main street. Well, let's carry on around to the back now. Well, we've got one thing right. What we've got here is the servicing entrance at the back. That's where the dump trucks go. You want to hide that away around the back. But we've got a cafe or a restaurant something next to it. Well, that's lovely to sit in and watch the dump trucks go in, isn't it? Well, great. <laughs> this doesn't really fit into the city particularly well. It's an amazing piece of design, but at street level, 
it doesn't fit with the street. And that matters because in a city, we spend our time on the street. So I can explain that better a bit further with a model. So let's get rid of the cooking and clear the studio. So now I've made a model of a crossroads or I suppose an intersection if you're from a former colony. And what we see here is we've got two roads that intersect at 90 degrees to one another. And we have all of the buildings exactly the same distance from the street, a bit like New York. And that impacts on how we feel the street. Now we're looking at a plan here and people look at cities from up above, but actually we don't live there. We live down the street. So Dan, let's get the camera down on the street and see that view. Well, we can see that the street looks dead straight. It looks quite dull. We can pretty much see forever. In fact, if I move this obelisk, we can see it miles away and we can barely even tell there's a junction on the street. But if we start to move the buildings around slightly, if we change the angle of that junction, we change the view down the street and that actually makes it more interesting as a place. Similarly, if we push some of these buildings around as well, that also impacts on how we feel the street and how we perceive the space. And we suddenly have a much, much more interesting street. And that's because of the relationship between the buildings and the street. It's nothing to do with the architecture of the buildings. All these buildings are exactly the same. Wooden, I suppose, for this, the purposes of this model. But now they are far more interesting because they relate to each other better. And it's that relationship that really matters in a city, not architecture. So that is a theme I'm going to carry on with and hopefully explain a bit better. So next I'm going to talk about change in the city and cities are constantly changing. Cities have always changed and always will change and change has different forms. We can strengthen and protect, we can fix problems, we can build new or build bigger and quite often densify in cities where they are growing. And if we take this sort of situation, if we take this one building or say this building, then we could redevelop that. That's fairly straightforward, it doesn't fundamentally change how the place works. It's a bit like a project on grand designs where this group of different built environment professionals sort of interface with each other. They don't really need to know what they all do. They all work in different stages and hopefully building that goes a bit better than something on Kevin McLeod's show and you end up with it being built to budget and to program, which never seems to happen. But if we look at somewhere like this, then things are different. This is trying to change a whole place. So this is an estate in the London Borough of Southwark, which I'll take you to later, where I have a model here representing what it was like before it was hacked to pieces in the 60s or the Germans bombed it in the 40s, where we had a series of roads. Facing those roads, we had blocks of terraced houses and we had then red ownership plots within there where we had the ownership split into multiple different owners. And Along came the Germans or the planners in the 60s. What they did was wiped out all of that lot. All those different ownerships, they got rid of, so, you know, chucked that out of the way. And then stuck in some great big, pretty monolithic box that just don't interface particularly well with the place. And it's actually not one of the worst examples of this. There's worse, but it's not great. And if we want to fix that, it's really difficult because all these different people have to fit together, have to mesh together, have to understand what they're going to do. Because we're going to have to slowly take out parts while we find new homes for people who were there. So we probably start to look at putting back something that was there before. And probably trying to increase the density. In this location, we can really put back what was there before because we've still got a street structure that buildings can interface with. So let's take out a couple of these blocks. Let's assume we sort of put back broadly what was there, but it will be a different form. Leave a part out so we've got some, some open space. But as we say, we're going to build taller and that allows us to get more homes in to fund the scheme and to meet that desperate need for homes we've got in this country. And in doing that, everyone thinks, well, the planners plan cities, architects design cities. Well, no. Architects design that building. A planner gets planning permission for that building. But to design this, 
we essentially start with urban practitioners, urban designers, and urban, other urban professionals, such as development surveyors, looking at how we can fix it, how it's deliverable, what is wrong with the place, interfacing with the community to try and design a solution which is deliverable. And that's when it gets really difficult because the community essentially mistrusts all of these professionals because they don't explain what they do very well. And in the past, they've built rubbish like this and not explained it very well and quite often claimed to be experts when they weren't. And it becomes really challenging. It becomes particularly challenging because change only really happens in our cities if it makes sense in, in money terms. And money matters in the city because things cost a lot of money and things have a value. And if we don't understand that, well, we're not going to really get change in our, our cities that we, that we want. So most of our cities are owned by the private sector, generally to take a return. So your pension fund will own huge chunks of the city and your pension will be linked to the success of that. There's also big chunks of the city owned by the public sector and the public sector sometimes owns those in to take a return so that that return essentially allows them to keep taxes down or fund schools or things like that. Some things the public sector may own, like libraries that have a public good, but there's a whole mix. But generally speaking, change happens because of money. And if we take this scheme or single house like this, well, it's only worth what you can sell the whole of it for. So let's assume it's worth 100, so 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. And to build this, the developer looks at it and goes, well, I'm going to have to invest a lot of money. I'm going to have to take a lot of risk. And to do that, I want a return to represent that risk because I could invest that money in something else. You know, I could go and stick that in Tesla or in North Sea Oil or in government bonds. And the level of risk in each would be different, as would the return. Something that's really risky, you might get a really high return, but there's a risk that that return may not be received. Something that's really low risk, low return. So for the level of risk in this, the developer would generally expect about, say, 20%. And it, it varies depending on the risk profile, so 20. And then there's a cost of constructing it. All those professionals who cost a fortune, demolishing what's there, building the new, and affordable housing contributions as well. And let's say that's 20, 40. And then that leaves out of the 100 this amount, 20, 40. And that is essentially there to pay for the land. So if we take this situation here, say it's an apartment block, let's imagine it's in a residential area where we've got dirty MOT garage. We just don't want in that residential area. So we want to see it changed. But that, that garage probably has a value as it is. It could be sold to another garage or continue running as a garage and say, that garage may well be worth more as a garage than it is as houses. So it might be worth 20, 40, 60. Then we have a problem because it's going to cost that much to deliver the project, but the project is actually only worth that much. So we've lost that much money. So there's no way the public sector, well, the public sector could, and we'll come on to that, but there's no way the private sector will deliver that. But the public sector, as I said, could deliver it, could say, well, you know what, this profit, we'll take the risk and we won't take a return. We'll, we'll put that in so that we can make it happen, so we can buy that garage or move that garage, and then we'll make this project happen because we see a public good in it. But in doing that, they've taken no return, they've taken all the risk, and it could be that something goes wrong, it actually costs that much. So they have to find that money from somewhere, which means stealing it from schools or stealing it from your tax revenue. Or if they get it right, what they could have done was invested that money in something else, which again would keep tax revenues down or would allow some funding to be provided to other public goods. So there's a real balance. If the public sector takes on delivering stuff like this, it has to weigh it up against other considerations. So I'm afraid Jeremy Corbyn's not going to like this, but the public sector isn't the only part to deliver stuff. The private sector needs to deliver lots and lots of stuff. And contrary to what the other Jeremy, Jeremy Clarkson, um, like, the, uh, the public sector also needs to build stuff, really. And the only time we've ever built enough homes in this country is when both have built. 
separately and jointly where appropriate. And we just need to make sure that the homes the public sector build aren't just Austin Allegro homes, and the homes that the private sector build aren't just Bugatti Veyron homes. And if we do that and we get both delivering, then we might stand a chance of building enough houses to house our people. Well, those numbers, principles, and how we deliver change hopefully sets a theme for how difficult it is to create change in the city. And, um, well, keep thinking about money. Well, next, I'd like you to continue the theme of not entirely thinking about buildings in a city, but now start to think about the layers that make up a city. In fact, think about before the city was there. What was there before the city? Well, probably very little. Um, probably just the natural. So we may have had natural features like a river. We probably just had farmland. And in some places, we probably had hills versus flat cities, and that will have an impact on how a city feels. But ignoring that and purely looking at, let's assume this is a clean, flat, natural environment with one river, we probably had some early human features that appeared that stayed there for a long time. So the Romans may have found the crossing point on the river, which eventually became a bridge. And to that bridge, you probably had a main road eventually that connected, and then all the roads that connected to that. So you get a layer which is the streets in a place. And in those streets, you'll have all these services, water, gas, power, and such like. So once they're there, they're really difficult to move. And between those streets, you have blocks of land. And in those blocks of land, you have ownership plots. These red areas here that will you know, vary by location. And you may have one where the plot is the same as the block, or the block may be split up into different plots. And then sat within that, you will have the buildings, essentially floating as a layer again. That situation exists in pretty much any urban environment. This is somewhere which is probably akin to the New York situation of streets that are all 90 degrees to one another, the buildings the same distance from the street. Here's a location which is probably similar to a 1960s development. Big slab buildings, streets that don't really go particularly anywhere. You know, there's really an obvious connection missing there. And they're actually very similar buildings to these. But that street structure means that it feels different as a place. And that's not the building layer, because those buildings, you know, that and that, are pretty much interchangeable. But we have a layer beneath that differs to that, and then we have a street layer that differs to that. And if we want to achieve change in the city, Changing one building is fairly easy. We can make you know, that building taller. We could make these buildings taller. But that then starts to change the feel of the street. And actually, if we want to build tall, we might want a wider street to make it feel so it suits the, the character that we're, we're seeking. And you can't do that once that street layers in. Or take this area here, next to the river. It seems quite underused with all the low-rise buildings in. Well, shall we allow taller buildings? Okay, well, if we do that, we end up with buildings that are sat right next to each other, and then you can only really have windows in the sides, otherwise they're purely looking into each other, so it doesn't really work for many uses. So what you need to do there is actually clear away all of that. You can't change it by changing one building and change that layer further down so that you can put something bigger in. Now, that will be fairly straightforward. If we move to this situation here, where, say, we've got obvious connections that are missing. Well, to change that, we'd have to take this layer off, have to take this layer off, and then we'd have to go back several stages, drop in these connections. And by the time we've done that, they won't have to start to mess all of this layer up and mess all of this layer up. And it's really difficult to do that once all these layers are in place, because essentially, once these layers are in place, they can sit there for hundreds of years. So we really have to get those layers right to start with if we want to have a place which has the character that we seek in a city. And before we start looking at, you know, trying to make it better by changing that building or polishing the street, we really need to look at are there any problems with those layers that we, we need to change. So hopefully now you're thinking layers and thinking even less about buildings.
Well, previously, I asked you to think about streets as one of those layers that build up in the city. But actually, streets, we also have to think about them as a network or a grid, if you like. Think of New York. That's probably what you think of when I say grid. But London, Sacramento, they're all grids, different types of grids, but they're all about the same scale. And that grid has a big impact on how the city feels. So if we look at this plan here of a town I've largely made up, let's assume this is a market town. So you've got the market square here, and we've got lots of roads connecting. And the most connected space is the main road or the market square here. So that's where we get the main commercial uses. And we find the sort of medieval part of the town here where we've got all the roads interconnecting at about every 80 to 100 meters. It's really accessible to get about. We've got a big site here. We might have a factory or a livestock market. And this is a very distinct character. And here we've got a Georgian addition with a park and a circus and some cul-de-sacs or muses, as the Georgian like to call them. And that's all planned, that's all very regular, that has a very different feel. And you'll go there and you'll think, well, these are nice Georgian buildings, or you might not if you don't like them. And the reason they have that feel is because they've got that structure and not that. And then if we take this away, we see something horrific which was delivered in the 1950s, 60s, 70s and 80s. Some sort of housing estate, urban extension. And we see lots of big curvy roads, lots of cul-de-sacs. There's multiple different examples of this, and they, that creates a very different character to this or this. And people will go there and probably blame the 1960 houses and saying this doesn't feel very nice, it feels like a housing estate. But actually, it's not those houses, it's because you've got that and not that. So it's, it's that problem at this level of a layer and how that grid works that really matters about how we feel in the different part of the city but how we move around in the city if you think if you live here it's a bit of a pain to get here compared to here because you've got to go one route and it's a long way round. it really impacts how you you move around a place you know if you live here and want to get here you've got to go all the way around whereas if it was a connected route it would be easy to get from one to the other so this is really common of this sort of era and there's worse examples, there's better examples and I want to take you to one which is probably a bit of a Marmite development for that era and that is, that is the Barbican. Now I, I think the Barbican is actually a really good example of the architecture of its era but a terrible example of a movement network. To explain that, I've got a plan here which shows what was there before the Barbican, before the Germans blitzed it essentially and before the planners of the 50s and 60s demolished the rest. And if we see the two axes, if I wanted to get from one to the other, it was fairly easy. I went along the streets and got there. Well, let's go there and see how we get there now. Right, we're here at the Barbican now. This road used to go basically to the front of where the art centre is before this one was built. So let's see what it's like to get to the art centre. There's the art centre I want to get to, that the street would have taken us to before all this was built. I can't get to it because there's a great big lake there. I mean, the lake acts a bit like a moat on a castle. It'd be far easier if there was you know, grass there and I could just walk across a bit of open space. It'd be more useful in the city. Instead, I've got to go over this walkway up here and up some steps to get to it. So let's head that way. Well, in a medieval castle, a spiral staircase is designed so it's easy to attack people when people are coming up the stairs. This is designed exactly the same way. Really not what you want in a city. Well, I can see the art centre down there. I still can't get to it. Well, we've arrived. A bit of open space there to walk across would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? Moving back from the Barbican to the smaller town, the market town, or the smaller city context, or even the outer London context, you find that 
there'll be a whole series of urban extensions probably akin to this that have been delivered over the last 70 odd years tagged onto the side of the town. Every time there's a need for more housing, there'll be a battle and then the next farm or the next field will get released. That's delivered in isolation. You get something like this where we have a market town and we have a whole series of essentially housing estates around it that don't integrate with each other. In the core, we've got something like this, which all connects. And then we've got all these separate areas that just don't connect very well. And that gives it a very distinct character. So. It's no wonder people object to another housing estate appearing because they all feel a bit the same and they don't work particularly well. Whereas if we'd planned for that and we hadn't delivered this, we'd said, right, we are going to have 60 years of growth and we're going to plan for a grid like this. We're not going to plan for a field and then a gap and then another development that comes forward. We would create something which works far better. So if we take this second example, we've got the same town and I've assumed that we've planned for that. 60 years ago, we've assumed that people actually understood this thing around how streets work and how they create character, which they largely didn't, as we, we do now, and they'd planned for it. And you can see the character of the city in the centre is fairly similar to further out, so it doesn't really matter whether we'd had modern buildings or those 60s semis or whatever in the newer part of the town. If we had that old structure, it would have more of that character that people tend to like where they see historic buildings and they attribute that character to those buildings. But actually, it's that structure, not that structure, rather than the buildings that, that create that. So please think of the lair, think of streets and think about streets when you walk along the Mazza network. So next, I'm going to talk about open space because it fits with the street next to us we were looking at before and we can keep the same model, which is handy. And helpfully, we have open space here and here. And open space should really integrate into the movement network. And here, this part, the market square, is probably the busiest part of the movement network. It's the most connected, so it will probably have most people going through it. Here, the open space is much quieter because it's not as connected. So that really impacts on the character of the open space. Take these two examples here. We've got one green area that's in the movement network and we have one that's entirely isolated with one access. That will be far quieter. Which would you put a coffee shop on? Well, it probably wouldn't trade very well in the one with one access, but the one that's in the movement network, the coffee shop would probably trade far better in. And that characteristic of how open space fits into this place is really important at one level, but at the next level we have to look at the actual detail of how it integrates. So take this estate in Southwark. This is where we were earlier with that model in that first video. And what we have is the street, we have a wall to keep people out of this green strip, and then we have at the other side of the green strip a barrier at the edge of the flat to keep people from moving from the flat to the green space. Well, what purpose does that serve? We've put defensive barriers at each side. It would actually work far better if the flat had a little door, that was its main door perhaps, and an area of private space which led across that area to the street. It would actually serve a purpose then. What we have done instead is design something akin to the defences around the castle. So here's the English Heritage website. We can see a mock-up of a castle, and you have defences, walls, earthworks, a moat, all designed to keep people out, and then we funnel people to a narrow path to make it easy to attack them, essentially, when they go in that one route to the castle. And let's go around the back of this scheme in Southwark, and what do we see? The main entrance into the building, hidden around the back, and everybody's funneled off into one narrow access by railings, kept off the open space, and again, we've got the open space fenced off from the flats. We've got one person desperately trying to bring life into that open space. They've put plants around their balcony, but they've got to climb over the balcony to get into that open space. It just doesn't work very well because the whole thing is designed to keep people out with all these barriers. And this is really common. Here's another estate in, I think it's in Lewisham, where we've got a very large area of flat green open space and all the way around it we've got six foot high railings and a prison type fence. At one side we've got flats, again they're kept out of it. The thing's locked, what purpose does it serve? Even in new developments here, this is Greenwich facing the Thames, we've got brick planters three foot high, 
quite expensive to build, put grass on top. Then the signs, keep off the grass. You know, why are the landmines in there? What's the point of the open space if you can't use the green space that's in it? Here's another example. This is a really well-designed scheme. We've got houses. Each house has got a front door facing the street. It's got some private space. And we've got open space facing that. But we've got a barrier between the two to stop life spreading from one to the other. What's the point of that, that barrier? It serves no purpose other than to keep people from using that that open space. So when we design these open spaces, we've got to think about where they fit in the structure, but also that detail. Don't design them so there's barriers to keep people out. Always make sure that the open space faces the front of the building and life can spread out from the front of that building. And the next thing that matters is size of that space. With open space, bigger isn't necessarily better. Think of the market square. It doesn't matter where you are in Europe, the old market square and the old market town is probably about the size of a football pitch, 80 to 100 metres long. It's the size that people feel comfortable in. It's a size of space that people can see what's happening at a distance. It's easy to activate. Whereas if you go to big modernist places, here we've got Brasilia, we've got an absolutely massive area of open space in the centre, completely cuts the space in two. You essentially have to drive from one side to the other. It just doesn't, doesn't work was actually places that keep it simple work, work far better. And this is a really good example of that. This is a scheme which was proposed to have a really expensive water feature in the middle to cut the place in two, a bit like in the Barbican. Presumably for budgetary reasons, it didn't happen. And what we have is a whole series of trees, some hard surfacing, earth mounds with grass on. And what do we get? Life. Life spreads out to it. Life spreads out from the buildings and uses it. So. When designing open space, the devil really is in the detail. It's not in the dollar because actually, if you can make it integrated, you don't design it defensively. You can actually design it fairly cheaply and it works really, really well. So if we take what I've run through already. We designed a city that probably works reasonably well, but it's probably a bit dull. It's something like this street in 1950s suburban America. Dead straight streets, all the buildings the same distance from the street, quite low density perhaps in this case. And it's just not very interesting, but actually it works okay. But if we add some other features to that, we make it more interesting. We actually make a much more interesting place. And if we understand how we can do that, we can then factor that into designing new places or when we're seeing change in an existing street, we can understand what that impact will be. So at the most basic level, if we just start to move some of these buildings around a bit, that changes the feel of when you look down, down the street. And we could add some more buildings in to increase the density a bit. And that again would change the feel of the street it probably actually feels like a more traditional street then rather than like a, a housing estate. Or if we go to the next step, that's a little bit of curvature to the road, not too much, not like those big sweepy roads in the housing extension of the 1970s, but just enough to add some interest and richness to that street, then that curvature starts to make that street just a bit more interesting. And then you can start to look at finishes, you know, maybe planting a few trees on the street. And then you've got a much, much more interesting street. But you might want to look at building bigger buildings there, and that changes the street again. You know, simply dropping bigger buildings in there changes how that street feels. And we can actually understand that fairly simply if we look at the height to width ratio of the street. So, Take this street here. If we change the height to width ratio, it changes the feel of the street. So we've made now quite a narrow, intimate street. If we double the height of the buildings, then we change that height to width ratio and it feels really enclosed and claustrophobic and not particularly nice. But if we change the height to width ratio, we double the width of the street because we've doubled the buildings, well, actually, we have a fairly similar feel to the street. We then probably have somewhere you can drop a few trees in and it doesn't feel like it's entirely 
clogged up with trees. But if we keep widening it, eventually you get to something that feels like an urban expressway that just won't work particularly well. Particularly if you have low-rise buildings, you're going to have that, that problem fairly, fairly quickly, that you get to the point that something becomes not very nice on the street because it's so wide, you've probably got six lanes of traffic to cross. So that ratio is far more important than what that building looks like. And the next thing that really matters is probably more building focused. And I've been telling you not to think about buildings, but now we're going to have to. And this is a corner. So to explain that, I'm afraid we're going to have to change the models. Right, welcome back. We've changed the model now, and I've got a couple of houses I've made out of some boxes of boxes. And Every house is the same as pretty much every building in that it has a front, but it also will generally have a back and the back is usually not very nice. And when you design a place, you should always have the front of the building facing the front of the street. And then the back of the building should face the back of another building, so the bad bit hides the bad bit. But that creates a problem when we get to a corner, because what happens here, well, we've got the main front of the building on the main street, but then we have a side facing another street. Now, a side is not as bad as a back. A back will be particularly bad, but it doesn't work great. So how can we deal with that? Well, 60s and 70s, what did they do? Stick a house on a corner, standard pattern book house, drop it in there. It's funny sized front garden, weird end gardens. You still see the end. It doesn't work very well. The better way to deal with that is say, well, that is also should really have a front there. So what do we do? We put another front there. And in this case, we've got a main road and a secondary road. So we have a main front and a secondary frontage. And we can try and prop these fronts in and they actually stay up, which is quite good this time. And there we see a street which works far better because we head down the side street and it's activated to some degree. And we see that in good urban design, in good buildings, in good architecture. And here we've got a pub. This is a really old pub, it's on two important streets, so it's got two frontages. Or here we've got a modern building on two important streets, and it actually has the entrance right on the corner to show that it's got two frontages. So if we take how the corner works and implies that in a city, we can make the city more interesting. And that matters when we come to this model. If we take this corner building out, well, in fact, in this scenario, you basically can't see the corner building at all when you look down the street. But if we move it a little bit and make the street more interesting, then we can see that corner building. So if we put a more interesting building in there, we then make the whole street more interesting because we create a landmark when we look down the street. In fact, if we start to move some of the buildings around a little bit as well, so that the street just becomes a little bit more fragmented and interesting, then that feature building suddenly becomes a real feature on a really interesting street. It doesn't matter whether it's modern as is represented by this 100 year old lump of brass or old fashioned looking but like this brand new pastiche model. It still has the similar impact when you look down the street. Simply having a landmark there makes it more interesting. And that's even if we obscure it from a distance so you can only see it down the street rather than over the roofs. That just makes the street more interesting. And once we understand that, we can apply that into places. We can say, well, actually, let's design it right. We can have fairly simple, basic buildings, a few more interesting buildings on the corner, and actually we create a really great, interesting place. And frankly, we want to live in places that are character and are interesting. So that's what we need to understand and do. Right, so now we've been looking at corners and buildings, you probably think, great, we're looking at something big and interesting, building stuff in cities. Well, I'm afraid not. Now it's something really dull, street design. But streets matter. That street is the space that you occupy in a city. The structure has an impact on how it feels, but as does the design of the street. And when we think about that, we have to think about who uses the street. Well, cars, but also people. And most of the people moving around are people in a city on foot or potentially on bicycle. And 
cities are places where you want to be able to undertake activities on foot and you don't go to a cafe or the bar or shop next to a motorway so you don't want urban roads to feel like that so we need somewhere that's comfortable for cars and for people and we can design that so take these two examples here the big straight roads then people will drive fast on that it probably won't feel that fast but they will and then it won't be a nice environment for people if we take the other one then we've narrowed the road, we've added a bit of curvature to it, we've added some trees, we've added some variation to it. People just drive naturally slower on that, which will mean it's a nicer environment for people on foot to move along. So we've created this place where both those movements can move together reasonably comfortably. Now, if we go back to when cars emerge in the city, we've got stuff like this. Separate people from traffic, create space for traffic on the roads. This is a tunnel where everyone was intending to walk over the top, but in practice, people still walk through the tunnel because it's the easiest way to get from A to B. Or this example in Grimsby, where we've got a huge traffic junction in the middle of the town that's just not very nice. And they don't work well. We can design places so they do work together. We don't have to spend a fortune on shared space and cobble everything to do that. We can actually come up with some fairly simple ways to do that. I'm not gonna give you them all. I'm just gonna give you a taster and let you think of some of your own so you can spot these as you move around. And one I've drawn here is a diagram of two junctions. This is fairly common to what happens in lots of urban environments. Main road, junction, junction. This is the curb line, the back of the properties, and this is the route the pedestrian move on the pavement. So here we've got quite tight curb lines. So this mouse comes along for a walk. It's going to cross the road. It doesn't have to turn too far to look. The traffic's coming quite slowly because it's a sharp junction and traverses the road. Well, as in this scenario, we've got really wide, curvy roads. And here, the mouse has to look much further around because the traffic is coming much faster and has got a much greater distance of road to cross. If we narrow that junction, we reduce the amount of road to cross. We make the traffic move slower into the side road because it's got to go around a tighter turn. And it just makes a nicer place to move as a pedestrian. But you will commonly get that in loads of urban environments. So here's an example. This is a village near where I'm from. And we've got exactly that right in the centre. And it just doesn't work very well. And you'll see loads of little things like that that make a huge difference. We could slightly raise the area of pavement over the road. That would slow the traffic down as it goes into the side road and it would be easier to move along the pavement. And all these little things are far simpler than shared space, cobbling everything, spending a fortune on the public round, but they just make that urban environment far nicer to move through. And as with much of cities, the devil is in the detail. So as you're next moving through your village or town, wherever, please do look at little things like that. See where you can make them better and try and get them changed because those little things will make a big difference and they will make better places to live and we should all live in better places. So welcome back to citysimply.com. To recap, this is intended to be a free, easy access, hopefully succinct guide to the characteristics that lead to nice urban environments and the ones that lead to bad environments so that people can understand those characteristics and also understand change and support change or oppose bad change in the city. And why does this matter? Well, smart cities is a buzzword. And in India, something like 90 cities have been declared smart cities. Ones like this that flood, cities where there's problems with sanitation or running water. So smart cities can't really get us everywhere. We need to deal with the basics first, unless I suppose we go and live in the matrix, which seems unlikely. So when we think about these basics, well, first of all, don't forget streets. Streets is key. Every city should have a really good interconnecting network of streets, and those streets should be places for people to move about. And then we have buildings interfacing with those streets. Now, we have fronts on buildings, we also have backs, and the backs are not very nice. So, when we have streets, face the front to the front, on the street, and create a nice environment in between. Face the back to the back, so then you hide the back and the bad bit is hidden. Then you have open spaces. The open spaces should be fronted onto buildings. 
We should have open spaces that are accessible. They're not defensively designed. They're able to encourage life and life should flow out into them. And when we've designed all of that well, we need to think about making it more interesting, moving some of the buildings around, thinking about the finishes, and add some extra interesting features to create really great environments. And doing all of that is really hard. And doing all of that involves money and lots of people working together. And we're gonna come onto that in more detail in the second part. So density, well, density is something we have to talk about, partly because the British have an aversion to density. And why? Well, perhaps this, 19th century slums, or this. Huge, great, brutalist looking things from the 60s, many of which felt horribly dense, but actually quite often weren't that dense. But density really matters because density is linked to vibrancy. Even if you think of the village, if you've got a small local pub or a post office, you need enough people to actually use them for them to stay open. If you don't have enough people to use the pub, well, it's not going to stay open. And density means you've got more people, so you're more likely to have those local services. So take this, 1950s suburbia, lots of big houses set in big gardens, built to essentially move people out of the town centre or to provide what was seen as the view of the future in suburbia. And in the 1950s, in that place, you would have had probably about 56 people living there, based on average occupancy of houses then of just less than five. But move forward to now, we have smaller families, we have less people living in houses and single households and all people living longer in big single households, which means you probably have about 29 people living there. So you have far less vibrancy in the local area because there's far less people. And of these 29, Nearly all of them will go out to work in the day. They'll have a car to drive to the supermarket rather than using local shops to buy foods and such like. So actually the whole area is much quieter. So it doesn't even have that same level of vibrancy it had 50 years ago. But if we can get some more density in there, if we can shift these houses up a little bit and we can fit in 20 houses instead of 12 houses, well, 20 houses, gets us about 48 people in the same space, which is very near the 56 that we had in the 50s, and it's significantly more than the 29 we had in the lower density situation. Now, having 48 people there means you're gonna have more life. You're more likely to support that post office, you're more likely to support that local pub, or even that train line that someone wants reopened, or a tram line or something. If you have more people for any given mile of that infrastructure, we're more likely to get that infrastructure providing to have good services on it. So density, even in suburbia, is important, but the city and the high density city, it's probably even more important. So this is a model I've made of essentially this place, an East London social housing estate, which it's not great, but it's not a particularly terrible example of that type of architecture. We've got three big towers here sat in open space where the bottom of the towers is bin stores and dead frontage. We've got buildings here which face onto the park. Well, the back faces onto the park, so it just doesn't work very well. And a whole series of passageways that move around that don't really work like a network of streets. So it feels dense, but actually it isn't particularly dense. And to show you that, what I'm gonna do is take this layer out and look at what was here before this was put in. So before that estate appeared, we essentially had a network of streets and these streets had terraced houses facing them. These still exist. These are the Georgian type terraced houses, which are actually really desirable, but they're not that interesting. They're all dead straight, they all face the street, but they all adhere to those good design principles apart from there's not that much variation to add interest. And we used to have the same all the way across the rest, lots of terraces. So let's imagine we'd kept that structure of streets in that place, but we may have taken some out to create a park. Well, we could have then increased density on those streets. We could have built upwards and the streets would have supported that. They would have felt different because we had a different height to width ratio, but we could have 
incorporated that density in a way which sensitively changed the place. And we could have actually incorporated an awful lot of what we managed to get in the estate previously. And it would have felt like a place which just worked better because you had the front of buildings facing the street, you had the back facing the back, you had private open space, public open space, and you have a place which is familiar to people to move around in. It's logical how you get places because there is that good of streets. And we've probably got about twice as many homes in a place that doesn't feel as dense. So density can be done well, and in a city it should be done well, and it should be done to create those homes we need. Right, next, I'm afraid it's time for something quite dull but quite important. As you can see, no models, just diagrams. Well, what we're onto is context and demand. Context matters because you've got to design things to suit the local context. And demand is a driver because demand essentially relates to money and we need money to build things. So we have to understand these. And the first thing we need to understand is that some places are just more important than others. You can see here, some cities are just more important than others, but there's a relationship between all those cities. And you can change that relationship, but it takes time and it's slow. So we really have to think, where is that place and where can it get to and design around that? Then we can look at our place itself where we'll find a relationship between the different centres in it. Here we can see we'll have the town centre at the top as the most important place, and below that there should be a whole series of sub-centres right down to probably the corner shop. But in many a town now you'll find there's a town centre at the top, and then there'll be out-of-town retail, there'll be an industrial estate, there will be supermarkets, and different things that pull that demand all over the town. And that probably does weaken the town centre to some extent by, by splitting demand. But we can plan for that demand. If we're looking at bringing in new housing or building a new extension to a town or taking a big site in a town and putting more housing in, we can look at how many people are there already, how many people will be there, and how many school places are likely to be needed, how much retail space is going to be required, how many medical centres are required, based on estimating typical demand. And then we can plan for those services and plan for the cost of providing those offers, in which can be quite expensive and can be challenging to deliver when you've got an existing town, when you're questioning where you put those, those in and you know, is there enough capacity there already? And if we take this town we had earlier, where we have the old town in the core and we have a whole series of urban extensions, this whole town has grown in a somewhat haphazard fashion. And demand then has to be planned in quite a haphazard fashion. And you probably find dotted all over the place as a different services, schools will be here, there and everywhere. And it doesn't fit together particularly well. A lot of those aren't in the town centre where they probably should be. If we planned for it holistically more like this I showed you earlier, well, then we could have planned for a phased expansion of demand. We probably wouldn't have put a second town centre in because that would have weakened the main centre, but we might have put a neighbourhood centre in, which was slightly smaller and had, say, a smaller supermarket in and some local shops and cafes. And then we would have had the main centre, supporting centre, and it would have clearly and logically worked together to reflect that overall demand of the place. And in terms of demand, we have to think about everything around those centres. And what is that? Well, it's housing. Housing is a big driver in change, but mainly because we need housing and people have to pay for housing. So we have to understand those housing market characteristics. Now, if we go to the regional city, so here we are in Hull. Here we can buy this flat for 200k, or it's on the market for that. Just outside the town centre, we've got this house and a couple of other houses with a garden, decent sized houses, and they're a similar price. Now, which would you buy? I suspect a lot of you will be going for the house with a garden rather than the flat. And that creates a challenge because actually, the flat on a pounds per square metre basis costs more to build, and if it's more than six storeys, significantly more expensive to build. So we have to understand what we can build, what it costs to build, what we can sell it for, and then that allows us to guide that change in that centre because 
Housing in a town centre creates demand for the uses there because people are there on its doorstep. But you can't suddenly put lots of high density housing in if you've got a housing market like that. You can only really go through a slow change reflecting those market characteristics, guiding demand, but reflecting demand. And demand really is that driver of change. So you have to understand demand wherever you are. So next, I'm gonna look at why and how people use town centres or any centre really. This is a market square on the market town we're in before and people go there to do one of two things. The first is a necessary activity and necessary activity is something you have to do. Go to work, buy all the food in your kitchen, go to the bank if you're over 75 and we have to go there so we're forced there to do that which then brings footfall there. The other reason people go to a centre is to undertake an optional activity. Now an optional activity is something you don't have to do. Go to a shop to buy a 20th set of shoes or to go and have a coffee with a friend. You do that if conditions are nice and you choose to do that. So we don't have as much life certainty created around optional activities simply because it relies on people wanting to go there. But if we can mix optional activities with necessary activities, we're more likely to get people to engage in those optional activities because people are there anyway. And if conditions are nice, you know, while I've gone to work, I might nip out at lunchtime and get some lunch. So if we look at a town like this, we'll quite often find that all of these different uses, many of the necessary uses, have been taken out of the town centre and dotted all around the town. Some of the uses may not be necessary, they might be optional, they might fall in between depending on your view. But if you can move some of those uses back to the town centre, then we start to create more footfall around the town centre. And you know, I'll take this example, if we have the nursery, if the nursery is way out on the edge of the town, then parents drive there, push their kids out of the car and drive home. If we move that to the town centre, they probably do the same, but they probably part further away from the nursery, they pass a couple of shops, they meet another parent taking their kids there, they call in for a coffee or they buy something else while they're out or they wander around the market square to make it feel lively and busy. And all of that co-location of uses starts to create life in that centre and then that life inspires other life. So it starts to feel more vibrant and more successful. So co-locating stuff and ensuring you've got necessary activities mixed with optional activities in a town centre is really important if we want to create vibrancy because life works in that way. So, the planning system. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to cover this because it controls what happens in cities but also enables change and, well, it's just paper, isn't it? It's just dull, but it's really quite important. So, let's see how quickly I can get through this. Well, where did it start? 1947, government nationalised lots of industry and also nationalised development rights. So, before that, you could build whatever you want, wherever you wanted. After that, you had to apply to the state for permission to develop. So, we have this system then where you have the state says this is good, this is bad, yes, no. Essentially that system continues today. There's been reform constantly ever since then. Reform talks about making it simpler, blah, blah, blah. Other things come and make it more complicated. These key principles seem to exist generally throughout. And the, the first is that government sets high level policy. It says you'll do this, you won't do this. Protect the green belt, build enough homes, provide enough employment space, support town centres, these sort of things. And over time that changes a bit, but government has that big picture view essentially. Then, government delegates to local planning authorities, usually the council, detail of what happens in the local area. They produce something called a local plan, which will be fronted by this, a core strategy, which is probably hundreds of pages of vague words about support the town centre, we want to see this, we want to see good design, and then we'll have lots of other documents behind that, some of which might talk about things like waste and minerals, or some may allocate specific sites for development, 
or we might have some like this, like a supplementary planning document that deals with the detail of one site, or another one which talks about householder extensions, building conservatories and stuff like that. And altogether, this adds up to hundreds of pages of probably quite difficult to access guidance about what you can and can't build. So, does that say what you can and can't build? No. In our system, you should be approved permission for development if your scheme accords with that, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Also, if that says don't approve this, whatever you're proposing, but material considerations suggest it should be, you can get permission for it. So, what is a material consideration? Well, well, that's really messy, but it's essentially a damn good planning reason why this is good or bad. And that influences the decision making. So, how do we get decisions? Well, what we have to do is apply for planning permission. So if you're proposing a scheme, or if that's one house, say, or you want to extend your house, you will apply to the council as a planning authority for permission to do that. You'll submit plans, designs. You might apply for full permission, which is all of the detail, or for outline, which is part of the detail, or something between the two. And in your application, you'll essentially make the case for why what you're proposing is good, why it accords with the plan, what material considerations are relevant, and why it should be approved. So for a simple thing like a house extension or for a single house, that should be fairly simple. There shouldn't be many documents. If you've got a thousand houses, that's different. There will be piles, mountains of paperwork talking about design, environmental impacts, are there enough school places, highways impacts, and all of that stuff costs a fortune to produce and then gets submitted to the council. And the council staff then look at that and assess that. And if they're not sure about things in there, they will challenge things and they will perhaps take their own advice. And they will then form a view. And if it's a simple scheme, those council staff can probably say yes or no. If it's not a simple scheme, it probably goes from them with a recommendation to the elected members. These guys, all the people you elect from different political parties, they're supposed to make their decision in light of this. Chances are they make their decision in light of what their electoral concerns are. So strangely, politics comes into the sphere. Then, if they say yes, you build it. If they say no, only the person who's promoting the application can appeal to the planning inspector. Independent, non-political, non-biased, supposedly. They look at it impartially. You think, great, out of politics, unless it's controversial. Then the Secretary of State, who is currently this guy and in a few months will probably be someone different, then forms a view himself, recovers the decision, and then politics influences that. So, as you've probably gathered, planning is paperwork and politics. And if you want to change planning, you want to change what happens, you probably need to change the policy. Because the policy influences what can happen in future, but as does the decision making. And politics underlies an awful lot of that. Unfortunately, an awful lot of our local politics is quite influenced by older generations who have houses. People who bought houses 30, 40 years ago, rather than the people who need houses now or people who can't afford houses now. Now, I am of the view that if voting was mandatory in local elections, I think at that political sphere, that decision-making point, you would probably get very different views. And we might get different policy because... The people who make the decisions, their votes will be, reflect everybody rather than the few people who currently vote for them. So perhaps we need to get more people to engage in politics and change this. And don't sit there saying, we haven't got enough houses. You need to get involved in that and change that. Right, so next I want to bring you back to this town and talk about essentially building shit. But before we start building stuff, we need to think about what we're building and what context we're in. So what we've got here is the intervention matrix. And what this really says is that the solution really needs to be proportionate to the problem in any urban place. So if you have somewhere where the urban structure isn't there. You've got lots of big urban expressways. It just doesn't feel particularly nice. There isn't a network of streets. Well, you need to put that network of streets back. If you've got a place which 
is just a bit shabby, but the urban fabric works, well, you can probably manage simply by polishing the public realm and activating space. And you really judge the nature of the solution based on where it fits on this scale. So if we take this site here, on this town that we've had before, we've got a factory on this big block here. And let's assume that the factory produces something noxious that's not very nice in the town centre and there's a need for housing. So ideally we move the factory out of the town and we look at putting housing here. Well, how do we go about doing that? Well, chances are you know this is going to move out at some point in the future or you're going to move it out by compulsion. So we've got a plan, we've got a time frame, which is good because it takes years to plan all of this to make change before a spake is in the ground. So before that factory goes, we start to plan what will go there afterwards. So let's assume it's gone for now. So we start to master plan. The first thing we start to do is identify those points in the existing urban structure where we can connect new streets in because this block is too big to have just houses in with no new streets. And we want to replicate the character of the old town. So we try and create an urban structure that reflects that. And that urban structure then gives us a guide for where development can go. We start to say, well, next to the town centre, we want some high density residential because we're close to the town centre. We might have some open space in the centre and maybe a landmark building at the corner to make it more interesting. So we start to plan for that. And then we think about the buildings that will go in, not the design of them, but the basic forms and how we'll split the owner structure up. And then we think about the envelopes of those buildings. And then we can plan how the place is going to feel and it doesn't matter whether they are modern buildings or pastiche old buildings, that now has the character of this part of the town and not of the housing estate. You know, if this was 30 years ago, what we probably would have done was said, right, we're not doing that. What we're going to do is put in some big sweeping estate roads and some cul-de-sacs and we're going to create something like this and then we're going to put some plots in that fit pattern books, suburban, homes and some pastige old suburban homes and then we'll drop in this so it just feels like a housing estate and we've replicated that and it's very different to that regardless of the buildings but let's hope that hasn't happened let's hope we've got something which works better that actually has greater density than the housing estate stuff and we look at how we deliver this we might need to put planning policy in place to enable this we'll need to get a planning permission We'll need to look at how we get the streets and the utilities in. Is there enough childcare provision? Is there enough healthcare provision? And when we've started to work through all of that, we can also then get onto money and how we deliver this. And frankly, money matters with development. And for that, we bring back the money house. So let's assume the factory is on the site. And we've got to move that factory. There's a cost to that but there's also a value to the overall scheme. So when this scheme is built out and it all gets sold, the scheme is worth 100. Value of everything altogether, but to deliver that, we've got a whole series of different costs. It essentially fall into three brackets. Of the first one of those, we have the profit the developer wants to make. Now that Profit reflects the risk relative to risks for other types of development or all the non-development stuff, investing in Tesla, green energy, oil, whatever. But the risk the market is saying for this is about 20%. So 20 goes in the pile for the developer's profit. Then we've got to build the thing. Well, it's expensive to build. We've got to put roads in, services. We've got to pay for some new childcare provision. So we end up spending 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, building the thing. Then we're left with this, 10, 20, 30, to pay for moving the factory. But there's a good chance we have a problem at this point. So we've compulsory purchased this factory because it didn't want to move, or even if we hadn't, they wouldn't move unless they got the value it is worth on the market. And that site could stay as a factory. They could sell it to, say, a haulage company and for the haulage company buying it off them, they would give them 10, 20, 30. But they've got to move the factory and they need more money for that. So actually, they're not going to move unless they get 40. 
So we have a problem now. We have a scheme which actually costs us 110 to build, but we're only going to get 100 back from it. So what do we do? Well, one option is we could say, well, the public sector could deliver this and take lesser profit. But that means they take on all the risk. They have to then invest money in this that they could invest in other things and could get a higher return from. But it would make it happen. Great. But the public sector doesn't always want to do that. So what the public sector will sometimes do is say, well, this scheme, let's say it's 100 homes. Of those 100 homes, 20 have to be affordable. And this chunk is paying for those affordable homes. Now, when affordable homes are sold or rented out, they have to be sold or rented out at less than market value, which means they're worth less than a market home. So if the council says, well, actually, you could have only 10 affordable homes, that means the scheme suddenly becomes worth more than 100, which then might provide enough money to pay to move that factory. So let's assume that that happens. The council looks at the scheme, it pays someone who it can sue if they get it wrong to look at the scheme and say, can we allow the scheme with less affordable housing? If we don't allow less affordable housing, will it not happen? Okay, well, on balance, we want the scheme to happen, so we're going to allow that. And this amount of money which would go on affordable housing, we can move over to pay to move the factory. So, all of a sudden, we find that the scheme is enabled. And that is then really controversial because people say, well, we could have had 20% affordable housing. We could have had another 10 affordable houses. Well, you probably could have done, but to get them, you would have probably had to find another 10 from somewhere else. And the only place that was going to come from was subsidy, which is your tax revenue. So what you've got instead is you're not having to subsidise that through your taxes. The public sector is not having to take a risk of delivering itself and not getting a profit. And we're getting 10 affordable homes. We're getting 90 market homes, which means we've got something delivered rather than nothing. So we're actually getting to the point where we're achieving change, which is great because we desperately need those homes. So, town centres. You constantly hear people talking about the death of the town centre. Well, some town centres are dying, many are struggling, but most are simply going through a change. Most have got way too much retail space in them or in the wider town. And it is a change that they're going to go through as a consequence of internet training emerging and as not needing as much physical bricks and mortar space. But town centres have gone through huge change through our history. We really should look back at what a town centre was 60, 70 years ago. The town centre then was almost certainly the centre of the town's economy. It was the core of where necessary activities happened, where people went to buy their provisions, went to undertake business. Around the town centre, there would be a ring of mixed use where you had mills, workspace and housing. And all of those different uses would mix together and you'd create footfall from those uses. And over the last 60 odd years, there's been a drive to separate those. Businesses have moved to the office park or the industrial estate. Provisions retailing has moved to the supermarket out of town. You've had retail parks appear. The housing's been moved out of the town centre. So that's very much split that demand and changed that town centre. So now the town centre is quite often little more than cafes and comparison goods retail and very, very different from what it once was. And all of those are essentially optional activities. So a key way to strengthen a town centre is to bring necessary activities back living space, workspace. Workspace is hard because quite often in a small town, it costs more to deliver new good office space than it's actually worth. So it doesn't get delivered unless you can find novel ways to do it. So hopefully the toolkit I've given you will help you come up with ideas to strengthen these town centers because simply filling the empty shops with whatever or isn't necessarily going to fix that. Empty shops are empty for a reason. So we've got to really look at fundamental problems underlying that town centre. And I want to conclude by giving you one idea. Might work, might not, but it's, it's, it's something I'm going to share with you. And that idea is, well, here, let's have a look. This is Grimsby. This is a town centre in yellow that's quite weak. And in pink, we can see where retailers appeared over the last 50 or 60 years. 
There we've got retail parks, big box centres, multiple huge supermarkets where you can buy pretty much everything that you once bought in the town centre when you went there to buy your weekly shopping. And the town centre has suffered in consequence to that. So what if we said we want to strengthen that town centre? We want to draw a line around that town centre and say, why is it that that has to trade for restrictive hours on a Sunday? Why don't we allow that town centre, but only the town centre within that line to trade with unrestricted hours on a Sunday? But that retail park or that supermarket that's further out can't, so we bring that footfall to the town centre. Then, those supermarkets that could only trade if they were in the town centre would probably want to move there. In that town centre, up at the top of the yellow bit, we've got a really weak shopping mall from the 60s or 70s or something like that. It's an ideal spot to fit in a supermarket or a couple of supermarkets where if we design those supermarkets so they're integrated with the town centre. So when you left the car park, you walked past a couple of other shops, maybe a butcher's, maybe a coffee shop, you probably call in and engage in those other things while going to the supermarket. And you bring footfall to the town centre. And when that supermarket moves from that big pink site out of the centre, well, what else can we put there? Well, we can put houses there within walking distance of the town centre rather than building them on the green belt. So we're starting to create change in the centre. Anyway, that might work, might not work. It's an idea I want to leave you with and hopefully you can use this to come up with your own ideas to make urban places better.